hello everybody uh, here on the first uh, recording of a session for the European Rotors show. Um, this, uh, the no November European Rotors will be held uh, for the first time in Cologne, organized by the European Helicopters Association in cooperation with EASA. The event, event is succeeding the EASA's well-known Rotorcraft and VTOL Symposium. Today's online panel will focus on the eVTOL topics at the European Rotors and will discuss a weighted proposal from EASA, the means of compliance with the special conditions VTOL, which was really discussed hot after being published last year at the Rotorcraft Symposium. So um, I will introduce my guests, which we have for this uh, first online panel here, which is David Solar, head of uh, the VTOL department at EASA. And uh, then we have Peter Muller, chairman of the European Helicopter Association. Then we have Jan Hendrik Bolens, CTO of Volocopter. Uh, then we have Frederick Bruder, managing director of ADAC Luftrettung. And finally, uh, Tobias Bretzel, uh, who is a project manager at F. European Rotors at uh, uh, in Cologne at the Aero Friedrichshafen, who is a partner for organizing the exhibition. And uh, Tobias at the same time is working at the Aero and the E-Flight Expo in Friedrichshafen, which is happening since more than 20 years in Friedrichshafen for the general aviation. David, you will have had a lot of requests for this uh, means of com compliance over the last month. Thank you, Willy. Uh, indeed, I'm glad to be with you uh, today uh, to speak about uh, the evolution of uh, the Rotorcraft and VTOL Symposium and, and the uh, uh, within the uh, European Rotors event. Uh, maybe as a short introduction, uh, uh, IASA is, is the European Union Aviation Safety Agency. Uh, it's a body of the European Union and it's based in Cologne. And uh, we, we are dealing with all aviation mat matters. Um, I'm uh, leading the VTOL department, vertical takeoff and landing. And we are responsible uh, for all the certification of the VTOL vehicles uh, with capabilities, uh, including drones, uh, with a max takeoff weight above 450 kilograms. Uh, eVTOL uh, is uh, booming, uh, at least uh, since a couple of years, and uh, it has led us to um, create within the department uh, specific sections called uh, eVTOL and, and innovation projects uh, to deal with this uh, new community, which is bringing new challenges uh, for uh, uh, compared to legacy aviation. So we had to rethink our way of working, of we are doing, Focusing on safety, of course, it is our duty, but also enabling innovation. So the agency, uh, as I said, created a, a, a new team for that, and hopefully uh, leading the way uh, towards more electrical aviation, greener aviation. So since uh, now uh, you mentioned the publication, uh, but even earlier, of the special condition VTOL, we have done uh, quite a, a lot of work and uh, to enable this kind of operations, vehicles entering into the market sorry, my, my, uh, in the near future in Europe, both for manned and unmanned uh, aviation. Uh, we uh, decided to take a, a very transparent approach uh, so that all stakeholders uh, today uh, designing or willing to operate such a vehicles could have access to the same level of information Base their design on a common set of requirements. And also, uh, as a, an additional step, we wanted the uh, general public to be uh, fully aware of uh, what was going on, what was the, where the requirement that we were designing for this kind of, of vehicle. And so we went for public consultations uh, for a number of, of uh, major points uh, concerning these vehicles. As uh, we do think, this is a key uh, for the acceptance of these vehicles in, in the urban environment, for instance. Um, and that is, this is also one of the reasons why we want to reach more, uh, reach out more uh, people, stakeholders, uh, via our participation in European rotors. We uh, really aim at not only aviation specialists, 
but also uh, new startups that may discover aviation world, uh, operator, uh, maintenance organizations, um, mechanics, uh, pilots, to really uh, feedback us with their uh, concern, ideas, or, or uh, new way of doing. Uh, doing so, um, we, we had an approach where we had a kind of a building block or stepped approach. We cannot do everything at the same time. So um, we, we moved step by step on this, uh, I would say, very complex subject. We look at the options and all the flexibility we had, and we came up with a special condition VTOL, which was public, published sorry, last year uh, in, uh, in 2019, around July, uh, for public consultation, and which is now uh, in its final version published on, on EASA website. This special condition is setting up the scene of the requirement for all um, VTOL that uh, are designed in Europe and, and potentially worldwide because we have a lot of, uh, uh, I would say, uh, non-European stakeholders coming to us to try to uh, figure out and understand a bit better. So this uh, first step was the definition of the certification requirement. Here also we, we've uh, taken an approach which was quite uh, innovative with performance-based standard without prescriptive requirement to enable uh, manufacturers uh, or startups to use the maximum flexibility in their approach to design their vehicles and also because we are facing a number of configurations uh, which are ranging from multi-rotor, uh, vector thrust, combination, uh, fully electric, hybrid, um, conventional uh, type of vehicles, uh, so uh, able to handle all these uh, points. And also uh, trying to uh, match as much as possible uh, all the business models, which are uh, popping up here and there, and offering also different technology trade-offs. Um, that was, uh, and the scope of the special condition has been uh, for person carrying VTOL, heavier than air, within the small category, because that's the first one we are facing today. And uh, with uh, uh, multiple lift thrust unit, when we say multiple, is above than two, so starting at three, so that we are not mixing with conventional rotorcraft uh, requirements. And uh, there are a lot of uh, novelties or, or innovation in these requirements. You know, we can also innovate in, in the regulation aspects. For instance, for the first time, we have mixed operation and airworthiness. Uh, depending on, on the operation, you will end up with different level of safety, either basic category or enhanced category. We have also integrated the recorders because we do think that for this kind of vehicles, it's very important to build up a huge database of, of, um, of data that we could use later on to, uh, I would say, better analyze uh, the requirement and how we can amend them, looking very deeply into, uh, into, uh, into the data. That was the first step. The second step was also to address the propulsion systems. Uh, this propulsion system, we issued also uh, special conditions, uh, let's say, uh, beginning of this year which was uh, on electric and hybrid, uh, hybrid propulsion systems. Uh, the consultation period just uh, went over recently, and we are beginning the work to uh, analyze them, and then it will be published as a final version by the end of the year. Here, we are addressing the complete range of propulsion system from fully electric to hybrid, uh, and uh, based on batteries or not, or other technologies, here also performance-based, enabling a second uh, wave uh, of requirement for the uh, manufacturer to design their system. And very recently, in May, uh, we, uh, sorry, beginning of June, we issued the first, um, what we call priority ones means of compliance, so how to uh, uh, make sure that you are uh, compliant with the requirement on the eVTOL, and here we are proposing some uh, means of compliance from uh, flight load, structure, handling qualities, uh, high energy fragment, burst track, emergency landing conditions, energy storage, uh, crash resistance, fly-by-wire design, lightning and earth, and also recorder installation. So quite an extensive first steps. And that was priority one based on uh, industry feedback where they need uh, a big impact on design. The consultation is, is on and, and will be uh, ending on the 21st of July. And of course, uh, we will 
present the outcome at uh, the next uh, session of uh, the VTOL and Rotorcraft Symposium during European Rotors. In parallel, we are also working on the second wave on the priority two means of compliance, which will be presented as a first during uh, also uh, European Rotors and during the eVTOL session by the EASA uh, experts who are working on that, uh, like we did last year for some of the priority one. Lastly, in parallel, we are also working with standardization bodies such as Eurocae uh, to establish other means of compliance uh, together with the industry. Of course, it's a permanent dialogue to enable this vehicle to enter into the market as we speak. Uh, looking forward to European rotors, uh, really, uh, as I said, IASA will host uh, uh, the Rotorcraft and Vital Symposium uh, during this event, which will take place during the between the 10th and the 11th of November. The session of the Wednesday afternoon, the 11th, 11th, uh, will be dedicated to the means of compliance on VTOL. So uh, really, I invite you to join us to, uh, if you are interested in, in these technologies um, and where all experts will um, really explain the background of the proposed second wave of mean of compliance. It will be a very good opportunity for everybody who is attending to provide direct feedback to also uh, ask questions and, and uh, we will as much as possible answer uh, as much as we can. Uh, and um, in addition to, uh, to the, we say the symposium part, there will be some sessions uh, live also uh, in the main, I would say hall, exhibit hall, where uh, several key, uh, I would say keynote speaker will, will present eVTOL aspects, uh, whether it is probably uh, on the propulsion sides or other. It will be organized by, by obviously, um, Mr. Freddy Schaffen and, and European Rotors organization for this live session. Uh, as, a, as a closing statement, I would like to say that uh, we are working uh, extensively on, on uh, VTOL aspects, eVTOL, but not only. We are working also on gyroplane, uh, which could be uh, partially some answer in some uh, also uh, environment. And by the way, we have published also a special condition on that. It's rotor and a number of uh, electrical and hybrid VTOL with distributed propulsion. Industry is coming with, with new ideas, and we are excited by all these challenges. At the same time, uh, we need to keep uh, our feet on ground and sometimes uh, looks a bit severe, but uh, at least we are uh, really um, convinced that uh, safety will be paramount for public acceptance. And you know, if we have a couple of crash early on during the development of these vehicles, the market will, will disappear and vanish. So uh, that's a difficult sometimes for some companies to fully understand these aspects, but aviation has always been different, been different with regards to this kind of, uh, of you know, uh, public awareness uh, and, and uh, the expectations on the safety level. Nevertheless, uh, uh, even though we are we are uh, right now going through and, and especially aviation uh, very I would say tough times and challenging times it's a pivoting moment uh, that will enable aviation to change probably much faster that, than anticipated and uh, we must be able to cope with it and be better at the end of the day better in safety but also better in in the green and, and environmental aspects and I'm sure uh, we will achieve that all together uh, via uh, an open and transparent dialogue, and that's what we are currently doing. Thank you for that. I will give the word to uh, Peter Muller, chairman of the uh, European Helicopter Association, and will be happy uh, to answer any questions you may have uh, at the end of the session. Thank you very much. Very interesting points from David at this point, and I think especially this difficult times which you're uh, speaking here, which you're mentioning. Um, I think, like always, there are cha challenges uh, and chances, and we try to grab the chances. So, Peter, please give us the point of view of the Helicopter Association and what you're planning for the autumn. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Willy. Thank you very much, David, for your words. Yes, um, so I'm the chairman of the uh, European Helicopter Association. So the, uh, the members of the European Helicopter Association are the national helicopter associations, and in those countries, where there are no national helicopter associations, single operators can also become a direct member of the European Helicopter Association. Yeah, we are proud and we are looking forward uh, to the creation of the new European uh, VTOL event. 
uh, EHA together with the other supported by Mr. Friedrichshaf will uh, organize this new event, European Rotors. And the European Rotors will be the new leading VTOL platform in Europe, bringing together all the leading actors of the VTOL industry, including the OEMs, the operators, the regulator, as already mentioned, technicians, pilots, students who will develop the future of the aviation industry. Talking about VTOL, um, as David already mentioned, uh, this segment of aviation includes the classic helicopter, but also the new developments in the area of eVTOL, as David already explained. Therefore, it is one of our top priorities to have the eVTOL manufacturers, the suppliers, and the research and development entities representing the activities in eVTOL participating in European rotors. We are looking forward to receive an outlook on the future of the eVTOL technology and to discuss chances and challenges on this sector. I received a question, or I've received this question very often in the past, uh, which is, uh, where do you see the market of drones, air taxis, is unmanned or unmanned compared to helicopters in the future? Well, that is depending on what will be technically and legally feasible. Generally speaking, drones, if we talk about drones, which also belong to VTOL, can be of complementary use to traditional helicopters. In any case, helicopter operators would be qualified as drone operators as they do have the aviation technical and regulatory knowledge. Depending on the mission, the VTOL helicopter operator would use either manned VTOL or rotorcraft, so the new generation or the legacy aircraft, rotorcraft, or smaller drones, or a mix of all. As an example, if we talk about uh, blade inspections on onshore wind farm, that might be done with drones. On the other hand, if we talk on blade inspections on offshore wind farms, a helicopter or a new eVTOL would be more cost-efficient because of range and endurance. Search and rescue uh, uh, missions, search and rescue missions, especially in mountains, uh, as an example, after an avalanche. A drone, an unmanned vehicle, could be sent out first, also in minimal weather conditions, to do a first search and tracing of victims, and then a helicopter could follow for the actual rescue mission. Or we have seen already examples in the past of transport of urgently needed medical equipment or organs, blood, etc., which does not, which does not weigh a lot from hospital to hospital or from the mainland to small and remote islands like we have them in uh, northern Germany. Urban air mobility in mega cities like Sao Paulo, New York, Mexico City, helicopters are operating as air taxis for decades now. But growing public disaffirmation caused by noise and pollution issues could be counteracted by using new propulsion technologies, as explained before by David, such, for example, as electric or electric hybrid solutions. And there are a lot more of uh, applications for drones and um, uh, new technology eVTOLs like logistics, uh, precision farming, and so on. Another question was, why can the new eVTOLs perform these additional operations which helicopters cannot, cannot do now? Well, I would say uh, that the uh, helicopters could, I would not say that helicopters could not do these jobs. However, in many cases, these new technology VTOLs may have lower operational costs or may operate more environmental friendly. 
the EV term manufacturers are promising lower acquisition costs per aircraft due to the quantity they hope to produce, low operational costs due to the new propulsion and optimized propeller and rotor systems. We are curious to see the real numbers in the future. However, as David also mentioned, there are still some barriers to pass to get them operational, like meeting the required safety standards when over operating overhead congested areas, collision avoidance using the same airspace as manned aircraft, infrastructure, vertiports, including charging facilities need to be created. The population needs to be convinced that the technology is safe. Sufficient payload needs to be available. Sufficient endurance range needs to be available. Promising concept with the right mix of range and payload seem to be tilt rotor uh, solutions, for example. As you can see, the traditional VTOL helicopter industry is curious to receive more updates about the new eVTOL technology and the opportunities it will offer to the operators. European rotors will be the platform for the entire VTOL market of tomorrow to share and discuss information with all players, with the authorities, the manufacturers, suppliers, operators, and the end customer. Thank you, Peter. And uh, yeah, you talk now about what you say, perhaps the vintage uh, heli uh, helicopters in contrast to the eVTOL. I think in future it will be really always this mix because there are the missions and the missions define what will be the aircraft which can do it. We now uh, will have uh, Jan Hendrik Volens from actually, I would say, at least Germans, but uh, also worldwide, one of the leading and the first VTOL manufacturer, which we all have seen already operating in different countries. So yeah, Jan Henrik, please give us your point of view and where you see the whole environment, the microcosm of uh, aviation going to develop. Absolutely. So first, thanks for having me in, uh, in this panel. I'd be happy to elaborate on how we see this new market. Um, so maybe just to start with, you know, what are we targeting as Volocopter? Um, so if we jump to the next slide there, Volocopter is designing an aircraft, but that's not the ultimate goal. Our goal is essentially to offer mobility as a service. So we want to operate um, the urban air mobility service, meaning that we are both working on the aircraft as well as developing the service because we realize that the success will eventually depend on offering an end-to-end -end, um, attractive service to the uh, to the customers and also working hand in hand with public bodies and with authorities on the uh, public acceptance of such products so it would uh, it would be too simplistic just to look at building an aircraft that fulfills the performance parameters we actually need to look at it more holistically, um, which is why we are also investing in building the appropriate ground infrastructure that actually integrates seamlessly with the existing city designs, which of course you cannot redesign the city uh, to, uh, to integrate such a new mode of transportation. To, uh, to start just with uh, the, the, the first enabler, which still is the aircraft, um, the Volocopter is actually purposely designed for this particular mission. So for urban air mobility. It has uh, two seats, so it is not autonomous, at least not the version that we are certifying at the moment. It has a pilot and one passenger, uh, which is why we think uh, we can be on the market very quickly. Um, the, way the, the reason why, uh, why the helicopter looks the way it, it looks is actually the exact arguments that were mentioned before in, in the panel. Um, if you want to fly into cities, safety comes first. So the helicopter has been designed first with safety in the back of our minds. There is a lot of redundancy and, and other features into the design that make it safe. That's where we are fully in alignment uh, also with uh, what was said before there. Um, the operating costs were mentioned as well, but I think what's even more important and what's actually differentiating the helicopter from many other designs is the low noise emissions. 
um, because if we're talking about environmentally friendly, we're not just talking about um, carbon dioxide, for example, emissions, uh, which of course are an important component in, uh, in our fully electric aircraft. Uh, we don't have these emissions, but at least as important for the inner city emissions is also the noise emissions. And uh, I'll provide some more data on that later. Uh, the Volocopter is really the benchmark for low noise in the inner city, which is also what's differentiating it from, uh, from legacy helicopters uh, in this case. So this is just showing why 35 kilometers, even in, uh, let's say, uh, legacy aviation, that is, that is not a long range um, for the missions which we are targeting in the inner city is actually more than enough. For the 100 cities that Volocopter wants to operate in, in, in the first years, 93% of those cities have their airport uh, within the 30 kilometers of the city center. So we can actually already perform in 93% of those cities the mission of transferring people from the airport to the city center and back. So we have to really, you know, be open for these new types of missions and design a product that is actually meeting the performance requirements for that particular mission. And uh, new technology bricks that are enabling EV tools are actually allowing us to do just that. We'll see uh, what it actually means in terms of noise. So we have a reference here for a, a legacy helicopter that is uh, flying at 120 meters distance over flight, uh, which is 87 decibels. Um, the volocopter in the same situation is only 68 decibels. Now uh, it's a logarithmic scale, as you know, so it's difficult to compare uh, generally, but here that means that it's four times quieter um, than a legacy helicopter that could perform the same mission. And we're absolutely convinced that that is going to be the differentiator why the helicopter is actually um, suitable for this particular type of missions. Uh, you see that it's, it's uh, 68 decibels compared to the typical 73 decibels which you have as a background noise in a typical megacity. So we, we expect that you, that you will actually not hear it when it's flying over the city. And what's even more important, during landing and takeoff, it's also very silent, which is, uh, of course, the enabler to perform this type of mission. We've been working hard uh, on, on public acceptance here. So I think you are aware that we have shown uh, public demonstrations around the world, um, in Helsinki, in Stuttgart, in Singapore, in Dubai. Um, this is not just to show that it's working, but it's also really to show to people that this technology is here, that it is here to stay, and that it's actually ready to be deployed. So people can come and experience it. And we believe that's extremely important for the public acceptance, that people are not afraid of this new technology, that they can come, they can see it in action, and they can actually uh, start to see how this could fit into their daily lives, which I think is a very, very important component here. Of course, um, the technology is one thing, um, then actually getting it to the market is the next step. Uh, so uh, one important point on our journey there was uh, the recognition by EASA as an approved design organization. So the part 21J design organization approval, which Volocopter attained uh, at the end of last year, uh, which is actually now enabling us to uh, progress with the type certification activity and actually come to type certification of the aircraft. Speaking specifically also about uh, the special condition for a VTOL aircraft uh, that, that David mentioned before. Um, so we've actually been very uh, enthusiastic about the exchange with the ASA on um, uh, having a certification baseline for this particular type of aircraft for eVTOLs uh, because uh, they, they have very specific characteristics that don't uh, make them fit very well in an existing box. So they are not CS23 aircraft, they are not CS27 aircraft. They have very particular properties and characteristics. And uh, we feel that this is the right approach, the special condition, to actually certify these aircraft. Um, of course, now uh, we are, uh, as you mentioned before, we are in the process of uh, having the means of compliance established for, uh, for the aircraft. And I think there as well, we're on a very good track. Uh, to actually come to an agreement uh, on how to actually uh, certify the aircraft, how to show compliance to the certification standards there. Um, and of course, Vol uh, Volocopter, as you know, is not uh, just um, designing and building the Volo City aircraft um, for manned uh, flights. We're also developing what we call our Volo Drone, uh, which uh, can be used for different types of missions, also urban air mobility, but uh, for logistics applications. So uh, 
non, non-human cargo, if you will, use it for airplane operations, agricultural applications. There are a large number of potential applications that we see for this aircraft. And of course, the beauty is that you can rely on to a large extent on the same types of technology here, uh, let's say technology bricks to make uh, derivatives of uh, this kind of product. Right, so we as well are um, very happy that we now have this new form, the European uh, rotors to actually um, display our volocopter. So we'll be displaying a volocopter there as well for everybody to see. Um, again, we hope that this leads to public acceptance that people can actually come, sit inside the volocopter, see the volocopter, feel it, touch it, and uh, see that this is uh, that this is becoming real. And uh, it's not something of a futuristic dream, but it's here today and it's here to stay. And uh, we're very happy to have this new uh, broad forum um, to, to be able to display this product. Thank you. Where do you see eVTOL can add on to the yet existing uh, part of aviation you're doing? Yes, thank you very much for, for having us in this discussion. Um, indeed, we, we might be one of the future operators of such technology. Um, having said that, you know, what we're talking about, and I think this is also important from a regulative point of view, we need flying objects, you know, and whether it's an eVTOL or a flying carpet, you know, or a helicopter is, is not really relevant for us in terms of technology. What is relevant is can we do it in a safe way? Can we do it in an affordable way in terms of cost? Can we do it in a reliable way in terms not only of safety, but that it works day and day and day on? And last but not least, and this has been mentioned uh, a couple of times, can we do it in a way that there's a certain public acceptance because pollution in terms of air pollution, but even more in terms of noise, as it has been mentioned uh, a few times today, um, are paramount and I would even say crucial uh, otherwise, there's a little chance of public acceptance, you know, if we don't solve some of the noise problems that, that we have today. So as one of the potential operators, I'd, I'd be happy to show you a couple of slides of, of the ideas we have about using those, uh, those new technologies. If you can be so kind to put the slides on and we can start on page two, if you like. Maybe as a background information, as, 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 as you know, we are uh, an EMS operator, uh, helicopter emergency uh, services. And, and what might surprise some people is that roughly 65 to 70 percent of our missions, we do not transport a patient. Uh, we are basically a taxi for, for the doctor and the paramedic, which means that for a large variety of, of, of missions, uh, the big size of the helicopters that we have today is not necessarily uh, something that we need for sure. So our vision basically is to optimize the EMS system uh, by transporting medical staff uh, with EV tolls. Uh, EMS stands for Emergency Medical Services. Um, and as I said uh, a couple of seconds ago, uh, the vast majority of our missions, we do not transport the patient on the flying uh, on the flying machine, but we transport them roadside or they're being picked up by roadside ambulances. Today, uh, if we take Germany as an example, there's a total number of roughly 5 million patients per year um, that are being uh, saved by a doctor. The vast majority of these missions, uh, 4.9 million, are ground-based and roughly 100,000 uh, EMS missions in Germany every year are uh, being performed by helicopters. This is the situation today. We believe that for various developments in today's society, the number of EMS operations in the future may even increase further than it is already today. Um, to give you a rough idea, there's roughly 10,000 emergency doctors in Germany, and unfortunately, the trend here is actually in the other direction, which means that there are less and less doctors that are available to do this kind of job, which means that transporting the doctor quickly, you know, and without obstacles to a patient will rise in importance uh, and relevance in the future, because if you have the requirements and the need increases and the available doctors decreases you know it's, it's a quick math to to realize that transportation and quick transportation will be one of the solutions to, to the system and if you look at the number of, of multi-copters today and then the ems system the number is zero and we believe that within you know five to ten years after implementation 
of, of, of such a technology in the system, uh, the numbers may rise up to 200 to 300 in Germany. Um, to give you an idea, today there's roughly uh, 70 to, to 80 EMS helicopters operating in Germany. Um, so you see that the, the, the number of, of multi-copters is way higher than, than the number of helicopters we have today. Um, and I do not believe that the, the new technology will be a substitution you know, for the helicopters or the ground ambulance. It will be, as you said earlier, uh, really, um, in addition to the system. You know, it may substitute and cannibalize something like 5 to 15% of the actual technologies, but I think that, that the, the cake will grow, you know, and it will not be, will not be taking market shares from, from actual players. Just very quickly to give you an idea of the partners involved in the project that we have right now, uh, which is a study. We have obviously the manufacturer of doing an amazing job. We have the Institute for Northern Medicine, which is a well-renowned uh, Institute for Emergency Medicine in Germany. We have the German uh, DLR, Deutsches Luft- und Raumfahrtzentrum. Um, we have ADAC Air Rescue, the company I'm responsible for, and our mother company, which is a nonprofit foundation. And we have two German uh, regions, uh, Rheinland-Pfalz and, and Bayern and Bavaria, um, who are being partners in this study um, to help us analyze whether this technology has a chance in the future or not. And if you look on the next chart, you know, these are the things we're looking at. You know, we're looking at it from a medical aspect, uh, from a regulations aspect, operational aspects, political and public acceptance, economical and technical aspects. So it's a quite wide based study. Um, ideally, you know, uh, tomorrow we would need a, a machine, again, a flying carpet or a multicopter, you know, that has a range of roughly 150 kilometers. Um, has a ground speed of roughly above 100 kilometers per hour, a payload of up to 200 kilos. Basically, we need to transport two passengers and some very limited medical equipment. And ideally, uh, you know, being able to fly during the night with poor visibility and then some wind, you know. But we are not in the middle of, of the Atlantic Ocean or the North Pole, you know, so the weather conditions we have in Central Europe, at least, uh, are quite reasonable, which means that the technology and the safety levels we have today would be would be sufficient. This is an overview of, of some of the real results we have today. And basically what, uh, what we found out is that uh, for the cities, you know, for the inner cities, the ground transportations will still be the, the, the element of choice. Uh, but as soon as we go in the more rural areas, as soon as we leave the big city centers, uh, the EV toll technology uh, definitely has a, has an advantage uh, towards the, the ground-based systems. Um, we will publish the results of this study uh, towards the end of this year, I believe in October or November. So around the, uh, the European Rotors Forum, uh, the, the, the first results of the study will be uh, published publicly, and uh, we'll be happy to do that, of course, with the partners mentioned above. We are currently in the feasibility study, which is uh, uh, to be finished by October this year. If everything uh, works uh, up to plan, uh, we'll do some flight tests uh, over the next two years and ideally start with uh, some really pilot missions and pilot programs in the two regions of Bavaria and in uh, Bangladesh in 2023 2024. Um, obviously, uh, there's uh, still some work to do in, in, in this direction, and this is why um, there are a couple of things that, that I would like to, to mention and then. It would be a wish list, you know, to EASA and, and, and to other partners. I think that one of the major uh, aspects is to have performance-based regulation, you know, and, and then ideally neutral from technology and really performance-based, and not only on hypothesis of what could happen, but really what are the experiences and how we can, you know, do this in, in a pragmatic way. The second thing is, obviously, when you speak about this kind of technology, air taxis are are the thing that, that everybody thinks about. And the difference between air taxis and, and an EMS operation is that we do not fly in predefined corridors. So we need a regulation you know, that will allow us to land and start everywhere and not only on defined landing spots and airports. Maybe not in the first step, but you know, in, in the near future, in the further developments of the regulation, we will need the possibility, like today in EMS, you know, to, uh, to start and land everywhere. Um, 
one of the, the first steps could be to, you know, the, the, the landing sites we have today at hospital sites, for example, uh, make those also certified for, for this kind of technology. That would be a first step. And then a second step, being able to start and land on the street and gardens, obviously with all the necessary safety regulations, but having some flexibility uh, um, in the operation. And I believe that this is one of the aspects that, that need to be considered. You know, we are talking in our case about EMS. So it's when you drive with a car with the blue lights, you have some lights that others don't. And in our conviction is that um, with, um, uh, with this kind of technology, with the idea of saving lives, you know, with, with this technology, public acceptancy uh, will certainly be very high uh, at the beginning. And this might be an entry door for public acceptancy for other types of, of utilization of these assets. So we're very excited to, to move on and go on and very thankful to be part of this, uh, this history uh, making steps that, that we're looking at right now and uh, looking forward to the further discussion. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Frederick, and thank you uh, for this point of view, which I think is a widening of the horizon, because right now in the public discussion, most of the time, uh, multi-copters, air taxi, and then flying with hundreds of thousands of aircraft into the inner cities, um, which probably will not happen that fast. And so I'm very happy to hear some point of view of a very useful, a relatively small kind of operation which could prove uh, these aircraft be valid. So uh, after having now all the players of the VTOL market, representatives of all the players of the VTOL market uh, on the, uh, let's say, virtual stage, which we have here, I'm now happy to have uh, last but not least Tobias uh, Bretzel from Messer Friedrichshafen. You're putting on the arrow over years, uh, over more than 30 years uh, with the general aviation. Now you move on together with the European Helicopter Association to do the uh, European rotors. So please let us know well, how does uh, Messer Friedrichshafen, how does you vi visualize uh, the European rotors, European rotors show can be for us as visitors? Yes, thank you, Willy. Um, yeah, first of all, uh, we want to address that we are really delighted to be the partner of EHA and EASA in organizing this new and very important event, the European Rotors, happening in, in Cologne from November the 10th till uh, November the 12th. So a very, very important date, uh, which every industry professional from the whole VTOL sector should have in their calendar, especially after the previous times with very less personal meetings. We think that it is uh, very, very important to finally re-engage face-to-face with all the necessary uh, security aspects. Um, as you already mentioned, Billy, yes, um, uh, Messi Friedrichshafen uh, has organized and is organizing Aero Friedrichshafen the leading general aviation trade show in Europe since more than 20 years. And within that show, we have focused at the very early stage, uh, Willy, you know it, uh, in uh, 2009 already, on electric uh, aviation at our dedicated eFlight Expo. So we want really, we want to bring our experience and especially our network uh, which we have gathered over the last 10 years and more um, within electric aviation um, for this new event in Cologne. Why? Because we see that especially the EV tolls um, are more and more evolving into the commercial aviation area, also within the helicopter industry. Um, and therefore, we really strongly want to encourage the whole eVTOL community, uh, which supported us with Aero Friedrichshafen in the last years, also to join us really this fall uh, at European Rotors. Thank you so much. I think in perhaps one of the future discussions we will have here, we also will have the options of people when it's live to join in with questions. At this point, it's going to be me who asking most of the questions, Frederick. Um, 
you said that you uh in your desires would like to have a helicopter which can fly hundred or a multi-copter or the flying carpet which can fly 150 kilometers um at this point i think uh volocopter is not yet there but uh still are there a lot of missions at a adac luft Training right now where you could use also the shorter range where we, when we will have only the 34 or uh, 35 minutes, which is the operation time with a speed, with a limited speed, uh, we are shorter. Are there enough missions there? Yes, I think, you know, we have to look at it from, from a development point of view. If you look at the first uh, Volkswagen Golf, you know, this car had a range of roughly 300 kilometers. And today the Golf 8 or 9, I don't even know which it is, uh, has a range of roughly 1,200 kilometers, you know, and then obviously technology develops a lot faster and, and in aviation or a lot faster these days than, than it used to do. So um, the answer is yes. I think for the pilot project, you know, the, the, the actual technology is sufficient. If we look at the requirements for, you know, having 200 to 300 of those uh, flying machines flying around in Germany, then we will need the ranges that, that we'll be talking about. And, you know, we have to be flexible and, and have a lot of ideas. And um, we could start, you know, with, with having a, a quick battery change at, at uh, the accident site. Many times there's a roadside ambulance there, so they could have a spare battery on board. Um, we could have, you know, one small mission, just flying one mission and flying back. The 150 kilometers is the range that we need to be able to fly one, two, three, four missions after one another. You know, so to answer your question, Yes, for the pilot project, uh, I'm sure that this would be sufficient. And of course, uh, other technologies might be interesting in the first step, you know, looking at hybrid versions. So this might be a, a solution to extend the range. Um, but we have to believe in it, you know, and then when uh, EMS started 50 years ago for us, a lot of people said it's impossible. You know, when, when, when my predecessor said, we will land on a highway with a helicopter, you know, uh, people called them crazy. 50 years later, we've done it 1 million times, just as ADAC. And this is something that no one would have imagined 50 years ago. And I'm believing you know, that we are going to find solutions in the next month and years that are unthinkable today. So I'm very confident uh, that, that there will be solutions. And one of the you know, challenges will be regulations, not because regulation is an obstacle, but we have to have a technology and a way of operating that will be safe. And regulation can enhance this and help us, you know, to find ways to do this in a safe way. Not only for the public, but for ourselves. Talking about regulations, I have a question there on Peter. I know you're a helicopter pilot. And on David, because uh, you would need pilots for this kind of aircraft. And they have to be kind of professional pilots when they have to have these missions uh, like ADAC Luftrettung. So would you, for the beginning, think it will be professional helicopter pilots sitting on board, maneuvering the, uh, for example, volocopters or others? Or do you think it, there will be a totally new qualification? Perhaps David first, and then we can have Peter from his pilot, pilot point of view. Thank you, Willy. Um, this is a very valid question. Actually, uh, we do think that uh, at the beginning, uh, uh, it will be a qualified pilot either from coming from helicopter uh, license or fixed wing license and then uh, with some uh, complement obviously to be able to pilot these uh, vehicles which will be quite special and the complement will come out from the uh, operational suitability data that is established during the type certificate process together with the manufacturer so that's the very initial step uh, and so uh, we will build up the bridge with the uh, conventional pilot licenses, I would say, to be to enable the, the piloting of um, these vehicles. Later on, or, or in parallel, we'll see how fast it's, it's developing and, and how much is the need. We may uh, also enable an ab initio uh, qualification license dedicated to a VTOL, eVTOL. And actually, uh, what we are thinking of is um, a qualification that is uh, much more flexible than today which will be uh, dependent upon the level of automation the vehicle will be uh, uh, fitted with. So uh, either uh, like uh, very basic helicopters today uh, without uh, 
automation, which is not the case of all these uh, machines. They are all fly by wire by their nature, uh, or uh, up to uh, uh, extremely autonomous, uh, with some possibility to have uh, auto land capability, automatic takeoff, uh, almost, uh, uh, I would say, no pilot input. Uh, but more a monitoring phase uh, rather than a piloting uh, ready. So all this range will be covered uh, via uh, some license which will be based on automation. And that's where we are heading towards. Up to at some point in time, because everybody uh, at least in this market is working on a fully autonomous uh, vehicle, uh, but that's probably for a much later uh, stage than, than the initial steps we are looking at. But we have that in mind to be able to, to bridge all the gaps and make sure that first there will be a, a pool of pilots being able to uh, make the entry into service at the very initial stage. Then if uh, you know everybody will need uh, 200 to 300 uh, vehicles like, like ADAT uh, for their operations, obviously uh, the pool of pilots will need to be increased and ab initial training, depending on the level of the machines, will be implemented uh, in, in the regulations. Peter, I don't know if you want to complement. No, he dropped out. <laughs> okay, we will have to fill the time until he comes back in. So talking about automatization, I would try, I like to give this question to Jan Hendrik because we had now first the question of the distance, like can you imagine uh, having, for example, a battery swap uh, in a ADSC Luftrettungsmaschine first? And second, when do you think your aircraft will be as as far automated that you could also have a non-professional pilot executing this kind of missions. Okay, yeah. So first on the battery swap, um, we're absolutely convinced that the battery swap is the right approach to take uh, on, uh, on this type of aircraft. Um, where we are operating, um, space will be limited, um, so we will not want to stay on the ground all the time charging batteries. I mean, this is even a pain for electric cars nowadays. Uh, it, it's approaching points where the pain point is reduced, charging times are reducing. Um, on aircraft, there are different limitations. So I think the charging times in the beginning will be quite high for non-swapping systems. So on our side, uh, we are absolutely convinced that, especially in the beginning, swapping the batteries is the way to keep the aircraft in the air, make sure that they are actually operating, making money, servicing customers. Um, on the automation part, um, I think in the beginning it's a very you know incremental approach to start with a pilot because it's a technology that we know as a pilot we have a very flexible um, sensor actuator um, computer. The pilot can do many many things that that many systems uh, would otherwise have to combine. So that's a very good way to begin. Going one step further and thinking about uh, what, what it could look like after that, if we see today how fast self-driving cars are, are progressing, and I know they're not quite there yet, I know they're also still in development, um, but if we just imagine what that means for technology, the problem to be solved in the air is principally a lot simpler than on the ground, especially in the inner city. So I can imagine with the current stage of, of you know, acceleration in technology that it's, it's really on the horizon to have fully automated missions. I mean, most of the large airliners are you know, flying for most of their flights fully automated with the pilot just being monitored. So it's, there's no real reason why, uh, why this should not work on air taxis. And I would have a question at this time to Tobias because uh, we heard before that um, Frederick said that they expect only 5 bis mag until maximum 50% of cannibalization, saying helicopters being replaced by uh, multi-copters, but in general would more see the market grow uh, and giving new opportunities for aviation. So, um, Tobias, do you think, because you have done the aero, uh, at the Aero, you have helicopters. Now you do European rotors. Do you see this more complementary, or do you see this as more as a conflict of interest that it will take away the hel helicopters from Aero? No, absolutely not, because it's uh, two different kind of uh, trade shows. Um, keeping in mind that European rotors will be a dedicated uh, three-day B two B event. Uh, 
very focused on the rotorcraft and the whole VTOL market. So it's a completely different setup than what we have at Aero, um, where we thinking of the helicopter hall, also targeting more um, the lighter segment and also more um, the GA part um, of that industry. So for us, um, it's uh, absolutely uh, not cannibalizing at all. Okay. Um, another oh, one question to, I mentioned this early in the beginning to David. Um, when you came out with the SC VTOL, there was a big discussion, I remember in Cologne there, uh, on the um, no single point of failure approach for this class, which is not existing in the part 23 or part 27 at this point. So um, now the means of compliance are out. Um, which are the ways for the manufacturers where they can work around, perhaps, uh, if there is a single point of failure which cannot be replaced, which cannot be doubled? Because like in a, in a helicopter, I think also in, uh, in multi-copters, probably there will be uh, the option uh, or the, some cases where you cannot just take the um, take it and double it for making it more safe or having a redundancy. To answer your questions first, uh, when you look at, uh, I would say, uh, the overall configurations of all these machines, they are highly redundant per definition. They are distributed lift, so of course they, they are fully redundant. Most of them are, if not all of them that we've seen are fly by wire. Here also, you cannot rely on a single set of computer. Uh, so it's really uh, per design, the single point of failure is already uh, uh, much more achievable than uh, conventional helicopters. Then you have indeed probably in some specific area and, and uh, mostly on the structure side, uh, some uh, point where uh, it would not make sense to have a fully uh, uh, multiple load pass uh, or, or a redundant, uh, I would say, design. And for that, uh, if you look carefully at the uh, means of compliance we are proposing, uh, we are proposing an alternative method uh, where when the design is simple, let's say uh, you have a wing with a, a simple spar and uh, doubling the spar will either be uh, not feasible due to space issue or will bring more uh, drawbacks than any uh, benefit because you have uh, hidden, uh, I would say, areas you cannot inspect. You could have some corrosion development that you cannot see, uh, cracks development, which would be uh, also hidden uh, within the structure. Then when it is simply loaded, simple structure, uh, straightforward and, and with some margin, we are, uh, and, and uh, was we what we call develop with damage tolerance, uh, we will obviously uh, enable this kind of design. I think it's answering probably 99.99% .99 of the concern uh, we've received during the first set of, um, of publication of, of the requirement. And it's clarifying a lot uh, the designs of, of the machines. Maybe we will face the 0.01% uh, issue, which I, I have some doubt right now, but uh, we, we, never know, we never know. And for that, we have still the possibility to develop alternative means of compliance, uh, which would be very specific to the type of design, and it will be a case by, on a case-by-case -case basis. But to really uh, uh, speak uh, uh, more generally, I think people focus on that. And actually, uh, within their design, when we look at it, hey guys, you are, you are already meeting that by far. And sometimes you are more redundant than it would be necessary, strictly speaking, for, for the pure safety. Uh, so uh, the focus is really on, yes, it is possible, do your maximum. We want to avoid the single point of failure, uh, which is the main drawback of a helicopter. Today, in some configuration, you can lose a bolt and some recent accidents show that, and you are crashing a helicopter. We are not willing to have that, and, and you can imagine that if you have multiple operations on a daily basis, high utilization of this machine, the probability will get much, much higher than what would be acceptable on a single bolt. So I guess the alternative is fairly fair, uh, reasonable, pragmatic enough uh, for all the designs to meet this criteria.
thank you for this answer. And I'm, I'm, I'm quite sure that in Cologne, we will have a lot of discussions on this topic. And uh, it's gr great to hear that the discussion is evolving uh, because this is the base of getting aircraft into the air that we uh, find solutions where we can certify and be safe uh, at the same time. As we have you back here, Peter, um, again, the question, uh, what does the European Helicopter Association think about having uh, uh, automated flight and having uh, which license will be needed for multi-copters in the beginning should be used for multi-copter in the beginning to be more clear and what do you think of automated flying do you think that that's a good idea or do you think this only will come very very far in the future okay so licensing i think uh, uh volocopter it's a, a, a helicopter with with a higher number of of uh, rotors and with a lot of automation so I think there will be uh, bridging possibilities from rotorcraft license, uh, commercial helicopter pilot license to a multi-copter pilot license. It just has to be defined. Concerning automatic uh, automation, yeah, I think uh, a high level of automation would be appreciated. Uh, like, uh, like Jan Henrik already said before, uh, automation is uh, today is standard also in bigger aircraft. So why not in a volocopter? Okay, thank you. I have to close the session due to time reasons. I, time is going really fast. A lot of interesting topics. Hope we will continue it in preparation for the uh, European Rotors show. And so I think, uh, if not online during the next month, we definitely see you at the European Rotors show in Cologne. Perhaps we'll see even a volocopter flying there, which would be great. Uh, and uh, Okay, so thank you very much for this time and stay healthy and thank you see you in cologne thank you thank, thank you very much, much. Thank you very much.